Hi guys, welcome to the archive. This week I've got another set of highly modular tiles for you guys. Things you'll be able to build with and reuse over and over and over again and save yourself a bunch of crafting time, foam, money and effort. I'm going to level with you guys though. My videos take a huge amount of time and a not insignificant amount of my money for supplies to pull together. That's why in the long run I'm going to need your support to be able to keep making videos. That's why I'm asking any of you who can to join me in the archive on Patreon. I've got some thank you exclusives there, like printable accessories, a live stream Q&A each month where you can find out what's coming next, and a vote on what builds you would like to see next. That aside, the most important thing about sets of tiles like this is you don't have to build them all at once if you don't think you have time. You can build as much or as little as you want and just come back to it later and add to it. There are timestamps in the description, so just bounce around to whatever you need. So let's start with the basics, floor tiles. I would advise, and I really can't stress this enough, going back and using the simple floor tile technique that I showed in the castle wall video that I will link in the description below. As I mentioned there, you can make these tiles from any Black Magic Craft tiles you already have, it just involves adding the connection system underneath, which is easy enough even if you've painted your tiles as a hot wire can actually cut through painted foam. The only addition that I've made here that I would suggest including is cutting a slot into the gaps in the grid to fit the interior wall tabs, but you can easily do this once the piece is already made. I started making some updated floor tiles in the stable video, and I continued the experiment by making a full batch of stone tiles here, though I can't in all honesty say that they're worth the time investment. They take at least twice as long to make, and from most perspectives the difference can't even be seen. I still think it's worth having a few tiles made in this way, if only so that you can use them on top of other tiles as raised platforms. Just in case any of you wanted to use this new tile style that hides those cardboard connections better, I have included the full tutorial here. Feel free to skip it using the timestamps in the description if you're just going to make the old fast ones. To make these tiles with the more hidden connections, you need to start by cutting a 1 inch grid into a 3 inch by 3 inch by half an inch piece of foam on both sides, either using a hot wire table on a low temperature like this, or just by measuring it and cutting with a knife. You want the cuts to be about an eighth of an inch or so deep. You then want to take a 2.5 inch piece of chipboard and place it over the middle of the underside of the tile and cut around it, again about an eighth of an inch deep. Use a sharp X-Acto knife to cut a few millimetres or about sixteenth of an inch from the little rectangular bits at the edges. This helps them stop looking a little bit squished. Then use the back of a paintbrush or a sculpting tool or hell, a spoon would probably do to push in the interior of the tile until the chipboard fits flush inside. Then you can make a few card tabs just a little bit under two inches by one inch with the corners cut off to prevent them from fraying or you can use ones that you have from one of my other videos. Once you've got those, squash the open slots a little bit more until a card tab can just about fit under the two and a half inch piece of chipboard. You want a tight fit, you can loosen it up a bit more after gluing quite easily. An easy way to keep it tight but let it fit easily is to squash down the front edges and back of a slot, leaving a little rounded bump in the middle to grip the tab. You'll want to make sure that the tab still fits underneath, but I find that it's a good way to keep it tight, but also easy to slot in. Another useful thing you can do here is cut strip from the edge of the foam that's just above the tab. This will help you slot the tab in when it comes time to slot them in when the piece is completed. Squashing it in at the corners first and then the middle is a trick you can use in the corners too, which makes it a little easier to fine tune the height of each one to make sure that the chipboard fits smoothly. Not that it's all that difficult, but every little helps. Then you just need to glue the chipboard in place with a thin, and thin is an important word there, layer of hot glue. Then just check the tabs fit, loosening them with a tool or cocktail stick if needs be. Once that's done, all you have to do is bevel the edges of the top and sides with a ballpoint pen, and cut some random chunks and strips from the edges. Then finally texture using balled up tin foil, and add random cracks in the stone using a ballpoint pen again. If you want to know more about these techniques, check out one of my earlier videos like the Modular Temple video. I go through it in a little bit more detail there. If you remember the interior wall system I mentioned in the stable video, you can now add additional slots for it by cutting a line just over about two inches long and about a quarter inch deep in the gaps between the slabs. Basically, cut the grid. This will allow interior walls to be placed within tiles as well as between tiles. Don't worry too much about this step, it's fairly easy to add later once the tile is complete anyway. 
At worst, all you'll have to do is add some dabs of black wash down the middle. Once that's all complete, you can paint it using the techniques I mentioned in my painting stone video, which again, I will link in the description. The only differences to that video now are that I chose not to use that red tinted colour that you'll see in there, which you can see in the pictures, finished pictures that I've done of this project. Um, and also I finished my experiments with the water-based matte varnish spray, which is perfectly safe to use. I've been using it for a while now. There's a link in the equipment list below. Although you can, of course, just use Thin Down Mod Podge. Probably the core of the system, these walls allow you to turn these tiles into full buildings. Not only to make buildings, but also to show cool cutaway scenes where only one side of the wall is visible, which is useful if you want to make the best use of what walls you have, or you want to give your players a better view. You can also use them to create full dungeons with wall accessories wherever you want them, at any height, any space, wherever you want them. It's easier to add the magnets or connection holes first. Doing it at the start while you haven't actually done any texturing is a good way to make sure that if you do mess it up at all, you've only messed up a little bit of foam and not something you've spent a lot of time working on. If you do mess them up too badly, don't panic. Magnets particularly can just be melted back out again by sticking the nozzle of the hot glue gun in there and poking them out with a cocktail stick. You can have another go. If you are using cocktail sticks instead of magnets, just put a cocktail stick slot exactly where the magnets go, just like I showed how to do in the stable video. I did decide to trim down from that video on the number of connections on each side, as it's rare that a wall be connected without other things connected to it, so I've trimmed it down to one connection on each side. If you are working with cocktail sticks, this should still work, though if you do prefer having two connections on each side, you can still totally do that. I ended up putting one magnet on each side, half an inch from the top and then one on both the top and the bottom, this time 5 eighths of an inch from the edge on the left. Keeping your tiles facing the same way is kind of important at this point, otherwise the poles of your sides might end up being the wrong way around if you mix them up. As a general rule, I try to have the north pole of the magnets facing upwards in the top and bottom, and to the right in the sides. It doesn't matter which pole on the magnets you call north, as long as it's the same one consistently. Magnetizing the roof edge tiles is very similar, just think of them a bit like walls. This is where I put the north and south poles on mine. It does need to be slightly different for the left slope than the right, as you can see here. This is a bit easier to keep track of if you keep all of your walls flat on one side while doing this, with all of the magnets on the left hand side for the top and bottom, and near the top for the side slots. I've used 3mm wide, 2mm deep neomidium disc magnets for this, which I've got links to places you can buy in the equipment list in the description. These magnets are pretty cheap, twice as cheap if you buy a decent amount, which you'll want to do if you're making something like this. Plus magnets are a useful thing to have lying around anyway. That said, if you prefer, like I said, they'll always be the slightly cheaper cocktail stick option. To place a magnet first, it's a good idea to mark out the right measurements using a ruler and cocktail stick. Once you've made the holes in one wall, you can use that wall as a template for all of your others rather than fiddling around with a ruler every time. You want these markers to be about half an inch from the top on the short edges and as I mentioned, 5 eighths of an inch from the left side on the top and bottom. Obviously you need to make sure the pieces are kept the same way around throughout this process or directions stop making sense. Once you've got these marker holes poked in, you can use the tip of a hot glue gun to melt a hole around the marker, about 2-3mm to three millimeters deep so it can fit the magnet in, and then you can use the hot glue to seal it in with. Put a little bit of hot glue in the hole and then put the magnet in, making sure that the pole is facing the right way first. This gets a lot faster when you mass produce them. I ended up attaching the magnets the right way around to a little tool I made from a cocktail stick and a blob of blue tack. It just made it a little bit easier to attach the magnets the right way around without accidentally getting hot glue on my fingers. It also allowed me to use the back end of that cocktail stick to push the magnet in and make sure it was far enough in for me to give a very thin layer of hot glue over the top to seal the whole thing. At this stage I found it was easiest to cut the card connection slot in beneath, as again if I messed it up here there's less wasted. To do this, just cut an inch and a half in the middle of the underside of the wall, about the depth of the cardstock, and then cut an inch in the centre of that, just under the depth of the card. I found that it was easiest to cut these measurements in, and then cut in from the middle to the edge. This makes sure that the middle is the most raised point, which then helps with making sure that the slot is actually tight when you're finished. When you have that, just cut a card piece 
an inch and a half by just under half an inch, cut the edges on each side to make it less sharp edged and hot glue it to the bottom at the edges. Then you want to make sure that a card tab will fit in that slot tightly. For walls connecting to floors, you want the tab to be cut just under an inch and a half by an inch with the corners cut off. This means that the tab won't poke out of the side. Once your connections are done, you can add texture. I chose to use the same half inch brick pattern that I used for the battlements here, mainly to make it easier to mass produce while retaining holes in the right places to punch accessory slots in. I cut the three main lines using the hot wire technique and then did the rest with a knife. I then beveled the edges, including at the edges of the piece. Again, if you want to hear more on these techniques, check out the temple video. Texturing is just done with a balled up tin foil as usual, making sure that you replace your bowl if it seems to be getting flattened or the textures won't be as deep and impactful. This is especially important for the wash to flow into, and if you're having problems getting this texture, this might be why. You can absolutely use a foam roller or even cut more haphazard shapes into the stone, however it's worth bearing in mind that foam rollers don't indent very deeply and they won't hide the accessory slots very well. You can of course then deepen these holes and add extra lines of the right heights to hide the slots, but this is even more time consuming than just cutting a quick brick pattern into it. As usual though, the choice is yours. Finally you can add three accessory slots a half inch from the top, three more a half inch below that, and three more a half inch below that, and you can do this on both sides. This is totally optional, and you can even add these as and when you need them later on. I do this all the time, and the paint job holds up pretty damn well thanks to the Mod Podge, and the varnish, and the thick paint. To do this, just punch a hole with a cocktail stick, about half an inch deep, at a 45 degree angle, and check any accessories that you've already made will fit in the slot. If it feels a bit too tight, just wiggle the cocktail stick a bit. This will allow you to put accessories on at the right height, whether the wall is facing outside or inside, as well as being compatible with another cool system I have planned in the future. Then we just need to paint exactly as I show in the painting stone tutorial linked below, minus the red coloured bricks unless you like them, and you're done. Modular walls that we can use as part of full buildings, as well as with dungeon tiles. If you want to make concave corners where the wall bends into the room, you can make a few of these as two and a half inches wide, with no magnets on the top and bottom, and a wider slot at the bottom so it can fit in anywhere it needs to on the side of a floor tab. The half inch gap can then be filled by a column, just like any other corner. These are entirely optional, and you only need these if you want concave corners, and even then there's an alternative using columns, which I will mention in the next section. As usual, columns are a bit easier. All you need is a half inch stick of foam, two inches tall. Cut half inch blocks into it, cut some chunks out of the edges if you want it to look rougher, texture it with tin foil, and then add two magnets at the top and bottom to line up with the walls. The magnet should be on adjoining sides, with opposite poles pointed outwards on each side, so one side is your north poles, while the other is your south poles. This allows your walls to line up around the edge of a building or dungeon room, with the north poles always facing the same direction. If you want the corner to turn the other way, just turn the column upside down. This is why we have four magnets on these. I generally texture these three inch columns with one inch bricks rather than half inch ones. This way they line up better with floor stairs and also, as I say, give me some variety in room columns. To make three inch columns and magnetize them, you'll want your magnets to be the same on the top and bottom rather than the same on each side. You'll also want them to be five eighths of an inch from the edge so they line up with the top and bottom of wall magnets. This is so that they can connect to the tops of walls easily, as well as each other to act as columns and corridors, so they can connect to the back of roof tiles instead of using cocktail sticks as I showed in the previous video. These magnets are only needed if you intend to use these columns as anything other than floor fillers. Columns that you only want as floor fillers do not need magnets. I've also realised you can combine a few 2 inch columns to look like supports for balconies within buildings, which is kind of cool. If you do need any tools or supplies for this build, you can find links to everything on my equipment list which is linked in the description below. If you do buy from this list, some of the links are affiliate links which help support the channel without costing you a penny. I'm just going to preface this door bit by saying that the scale of D&D minis is a bit weird. If one inch is meant to be five feet, then most D&D minis are about seven feet tall with biceps the size of Bournemouth. 
other 28mm minis are sometimes a little bit better, but tend to get thrown off in other ways like by having fists as big as their heads. It also means that a lot of dungeon tile kits make doors that look a little bit like garden gates, very short and very wide, or they end up making doors way too big for the creatures that are going to be passing through them or the buildings that they're attached to. My aim with this door was not only to make it modular and removable and so on, so you can create loads of different types of doors and put doors wherever you want them and all that kind of jazz, that's always fun. But no, my goal was to make sure that the door was the right size for the miniatures and it just looked right rather than looking oversized. If you want to make an easier version of this, you can just make the door square and take off any hinges or handles. Still functional, not as pretty. To do this, I used balsa wood strips a little bit thinner than the ones that I used previously, 3 sixteenths of an inch wide rather than a quarter inch wide. It's really easy just to cut balsa or lollipop sticks down to this width rather than buying more, but I thought it made the scale of the door a lot more believable. It's not crucial though, the size of the full door is what's important, not the size of the planks. So to make the door, take three strips and cut them down to one and a half inches tall and then take one strip and cut it down to two inches tall. The goal here is to use the longer strip as the dowel, rather than gluing another piece to the door that doesn't quite look right. Trim the edges of these pieces on both sides with a knife and tacky glue them together, with the two inch piece sticking out just about a quarter inch at the bottom and top. Then just grab and print off this completely free template from the channel Patreon page linked below. Use the template to draw the arch shape at the top of the door. Draw the arch gently with a pencil and then cut the curve with a knife. You'll also want to cut the sticking out bits of the longer piece of wood in half and trim the edges until they're practically round. Trim the top end of this down to be only sticking out a quarter inch and finish cutting the curve to match. Finally, you want to cut a small chunk from the bottom of the corner piece. This is to allow the door to be removed at any point by opening it and then pulling it down. Once painted, it should look like a little rat hole or bit of damage and add some flavour. You want it to be about as tall as the sticking out piece on top, because that's the bit that it has to unhook and slot out. You might want to paint this separately to the other pieces to make it easier. Paint it in your favourite wood combo. I've used dark brown, dry brushed with some dark brown mixed with tan. Now we just need to use some jewellery rings and crimp covers to make little door handles using pliers and glue them on just over half an inch from the bottom. This is easier by holding the handle using a little bit of blue tack so your fingers don't get stuck on the superglue. In my original modular doors, I used 5mm rings and 4mm crimp covers, but for this piece I picked up a wider selection, and because I had lowered the scale of the door, I decided to use 4mm rings and 3mm crimp covers. This made them a bit more well scaled with the smaller door. I then painted it with a metallic miniature paint and gave it a black wash. Finally, we need to cut out some bracing for the door. You can either just cut out thin strips of serial card about 5 eighths of an inch long, or you can use the templates that I've made for patrons to glue to some card and make some more interesting shapes. Entirely up to you. Once you've cut one out, you can gently blob some tiny drops of Mod Podge onto the little dots on the template to show the securing bolts of the hinge. Then you just need to paint them black and tacky glue them in place on your door. I found they were easier to paint while attached to a blob of blue tack like this. Once we've got that, we just need to make the door frame. To get started, grab a piece of half inch by three inch foam, and a piece of one and half inch by three inch foam. Basically a wall piece with a half inch trimmed off the top. Next, cut two quick lines half an inch from the bottom and half an inch above that on the bigger piece. This is basically your layers of stone blocks, we just aren't going nuts with the texturing yet. Once you have the template and your line cut, lay the half inch piece above the bigger piece and the template from my Patreon on top, lining up the bottom along the line that you just cut. If you want to make sure it's in the centre, you can measure 7 eighths of an inch from either side of the bottom line, and make some little markers in pen to show you about where you're aiming for. Use that template to mark out the shape of the door and the frame around it by making cuts about an eighth of an inch deep. Don't worry that the template doesn't seem to fit at the top, it isn't really intended to. The top of the door frame is meant to be slightly over the edge like this. Then take your pieces and either using a knife or a hot wire cutter, cut the square block out of the larger piece and the semicircle out of the thinner piece. Don't worry too much about making this cut clean, it's on the underside and will be textured so any mistakes that you make will be hidden pretty well. 
Now that you have your door visible on the other side, cut your quarter inch frame around that too, using the template if that makes it easier as well. You'll also want to cut that outer frame into quarter inch blocks that form an arch over the door. If you want the bricks at the top of your arch to line up on each side, cut them underneath as well and then use that as a marker to cut the other side. Then just line your door wall up next to a normal wall and cut lines in pretty much the same places around the door frame. Then we just need to bevel and texture all of those edges, except the ones between the two pieces. Leave those untextured so that the pieces don't lose any height. This is also a good time to install a card slot in the bottom and accessory slots around the edges of the door, exactly as you would do on a wall piece. From there we just need to place the door in the frame, closer to one side than the other and push down to make a little indent. Punch that hole a bit wider using a cocktail stick or a sharp object and wiggle it a bit to widen it before slotting your door in. Then push your top piece down over the door to get another indent in the right place. Push it deeper with a cocktail stick again and you should be able to slot your door in and the top on. All that's left to do there is hot glue the top piece of foam in place and add magnets and paint in exactly the same way as the wall pieces. And that's pretty much it, a modular doorway with removable doors that actually looks a reasonable size for a medieval building. And if you want a nice little easy extra you can add to that, you can also cut out some small foam steps with a strip of paper glued to the bottom to tuck underneath the building. That's very easy to make and it adds a lot to the scene. It's also going to come in useful for a future build, but you'll just have to wait and see what I have in mind for that. Windows are something that's seen a lot of tutorials before, but I've done mine a little bit differently here. If you have a preferred method for doing the window itself, you can absolutely use that here, as long as the end result is three quarters of an inch by three quarters of an inch with a piece of dowel or piece of the wood sticking downwards that you can slot it into the window frame with. This method I used serves a couple of purposes. One, it lets me use whatever pattern I want rather than whatever pattern the mesh or drywall tape or whatever it is that you're using comes in. It also allows me to paint individual panes of glass in different colors. Secondly, it just looks really cool. The leading on the window is a matte, the actual little window panes themselves are glass, and it all comes together to look like it's been assembled from loads of tiny little pieces of glass rather than one sheet that's been stuck in with something slapped on top of it. Thirdly, it allows me to create windows during the lockdown, where getting your hands on new crafting materials can be difficult. You can make this with just paint, Mod Podge, and some plastic packaging. That said, this method is not the fastest. If you do have some drywall tape or coloured plastic packaging lying around and you want to get a faster result, by all means use that. I'll link Black Magic Craft's tutorial on how to do that below. It's a solid speed method that I might use myself at some point when I can get my hands on those crafting materials, when I can leave the house again, at some point. If you do want to use this method, you'll need to start with plastic packaging. Cut however many two inch-ish pieces that you need, because each piece will be cut down to make two three quarter inch windows. I found it was easier to have them as a larger piece like this first though, because I'm clumsy. It's also good to have something around the edge to hold without getting fingerprints everywhere. To get started, go and grab the free template over on my Patreon link below, print it out, and cut and blue tack underneath these pieces. For the leading in the window, I painted on a mix of 50% Mod Podge, 25% black paint, and 25% metallic paint, in narrow lines on the packaging following the template. I'd advise using an old detail brush for this, you don't want to wreck a good one using Mod Podge, but you do need a fine tip. In a pinch, you could use the tip of a cocktail stick to dab it on, though obviously this is messier and harder. The line can be as thick or as narrow as you want. Remember, it doesn't have to be perfect. The messier it is, chances are you're just making it look more authentic. If you did want to use a cocktail stick and you didn't have another option or didn't want to try another option, I would advise maybe sharpening the cocktail stick to be as sharp as possible before doing that. My OCD initially had a bit of a heart attack at the uneven nature of the lines, but by the end it had become my favourite feature, as it helped the piece look more like it was made by hand, rather than modern precision machinery. Once you've got your lines painted on, grab some brush-on gloss varnish, and paint a little over the glass panels. Making this bumpy and messy is a good thing. Medieval glass was wibbly as hell and practically impossible to see through clearly. I did do some experiments with spray-on varnish, and it did warp quite badly, so unfortunately that's not really an option here. 
Again, if you want to save time, you can stop here with transparent medieval glass windows that you can see through in a realistic way. If you want colour though, the gloss varnish will help this next layer adhere better to the plastic. I've seen a lot of crafters recommend sanding the plastic, but I personally found that this just makes the piece lose even more of its transparency. Varnish is a great little tool for allowing you to paint on surfaces like this. Grab some washes of whatever colours you want to use. I used some old cheap army painter washes, and then use a detail brush to paint the panes of glass. The wash should apply evenly once you push it into the corners, so there's no need to make these layers thin beyond being careful not to use so much that it spills into a neighbouring pane. Although obviously this is less of a problem if you choose to only use one colour, but I can't resist making it hard on myself in the name of aesthetic. If some of your panes look more faded than others, that's great, that's more authenticity. What I realised when making these pieces was that what had bothered me about other methods they were far too pristine and perfect. Medieval glass windows just didn't look like that. That said, if you feel like some pieces are too faded, just add more wash until you're happy with it. Now we just need to make those windows glossy again by painting on another layer of gloss varnish in thicker blobs this time to make sure it remains shiny. You can choose whether or not to paint blobs of gloss varnish on the rear side. Doing this makes the piece look similarly authentic and textured on both sides. Not doing it is faster, obviously. Pick whichever one works more for you. If you are going to do this, it's a good idea to give the whole backside a coat of brush on matte varnish before adding your blobs. AK Ultra Matte is something that I found recently that seems to work really well for this and has replaced Lamian Medium as my go-to effect for minis if you were looking for a cheaper replacement for that. If you do decide to do it, you'll want to do it after installing it into the frame, otherwise the gloss on the rear will get scratched when you cut the pane down to the right size. Now we have our window panes, we need our window frames. Grab some matchsticks. Cut the pane down to just over 3 quarters of an inch by 3 quarters of an inch, and cut 3 matchstick pieces to exactly 3 quarters of an inch, and tacky glue them pointing downwards on the pane, before gluing in a full length matchstick in the remaining downward slot. I made an equal number of windows with the longer piece on each side, which allows me to have pieces for the double window that both open out in the same way. Then you just need to cut some more matchsticks to fit the gaps horizontally. You'll want to use tacky glue rather than super glue to avoid frosting. You'll make sure you give it plenty of time to dry. I learned it's probably also a good idea to add a blob of tacky glue to the sides of the matchsticks so that they glue to each other as well as the plastic. This makes it a little bit more stable. The long matchstick you want to stick out at the bottom and then trim it to a more rounded shape to fit our slot on the window wall. Once it's all in place you can cut chunks from the edges of the matchsticks to make them look a little bit more worn and weathered. And then just finish up by painting it as you've done all of the other wood with a coat of dark brown and a dry brush of two parts tan to one part dark brown. Or whatever your favoured wood painting technique is. The window wall itself is easy to make and very similar to the wall. Surprise, surprise. To get started, cut a 2 inch by 3 inch piece of half inch foam and install magnets in it exactly as we did for the walls. To fit the window, you'll want to cut a 3 quarter inch square from the centre of the top of the wall. You can also make a double window piece by cutting a 3 quarter of an inch by 1 and a half inch piece instead. Either way, cut these pieces with multiple small cuts, ignoring how rough I am in this video. I was a bit careless here. This will enable you to use the piece you cut out by texturing it and stabbing a cocktail stick in, allowing you to use the window wall as another full wall for environments where windows make no sense, like dungeons and that kind of thing. Once you have that, cut three lines at half inch intervals on the faces of the wall. I used a hot wire cutter, but you can use a knife. This is exactly the same procedure as you would use on the wall. Then cut a strip of quarter inch blocks around the edge of the window. The bottom blocks might have to be slightly shorter than a quarter inch most likely, and that's fine. Then just cut a line down the middle of the frame hole too, about an eighth of an inch deep. This is so we can slot something into it in a future build. Keep an eye out for that one. From there we just need to cut lines to show the same brick pattern as the walls. And then bevel the edges and texture the whole lot of stone using rolled up tin foil reopening any beveled edges after texturing if you want nice clear gaps using the ballpoint pen again. 
clear gaps like this make it a lot easier to hide accessory slots. Now we just need to take a cocktail stick, a sharp object like a pin, and a thicker rounder piece like the end of a barbecue skewer that I had lying around. Use the cocktail stick to open a hole in each side of the frame, in the centre of the edges. Make sure the stick is straight and not too close to the edge. When you feel too much resistance, use the pin or your sharp object, could be a clay sculpting tool, to push further in as the foam won't resist it as much because it's sharper. Theoretically, you could just sharpen the cocktail stick with a knife instead, though I haven't tested that. Then just widen the hole with the cocktail stick and then with the skewer. You might punch holes in the bottom of the foam here, and this is fine, provided that they don't take chunks of the wall with them, which is why we use the pin to open the hole. Finally, you can cut the bottom tab slot, again using the exact same method as the wall. It's better to save this to last for this, to make punching the hole a bit easier. You can also add accessory slots at this point to the left and right of the window in exactly the same places as you would on the wall. Again, totally optional and easy to add in later if you wanted to. Then just paint the wall up exactly the way I show in my painting stone tutorial video linked below. Paint the wood a dark brown and dry brush it a little with that same brown mixed with a bit of tan or your preferred wood painting method. Being careful not to get any on the window itself and you're done. Obviously you can make a ton of different window types, including this shutter which was very quick and easy to make from balsa wood, and use the same hinges as I used for the door. If you do want to make the windows faster, like I said, Black Magic Craft's drywall tape method is a lot faster, and if you want to check that out I will link it in the description below. These interior walls are great because they're so simple to build. The connection system on it is as simple as just cutting a slit underneath. Because of this, I tried to keep them as simple as possible, which allows them to be a nice, easy addition that you can just create a ton of and use however you need them. The basic walls are three inches long, just like the outer walls, but half an inch shorter so they sit nicely on top of the floors and slot into the cracks using these interior wall tabs, which are basically just little strips of serial card. Even after finishing the video, I'm still finding new ways to connect the system. If you stick a cocktail stick right up the middle of a wall tile, it can connect diagonally over the corner connection of a floor piece, allowing for angled corners. For connections, all you need to do to the wall is cut a slit in the bottom for the strips to fit in. You can do this with a knife, but it's a hell of a lot faster with a hot wire. Then to make sure it can connect at right angles, I trimmed the corners at a roughly 45 degree angle. Getting this perfect isn't required, you can be a bit rough here and still get a nice result. You can absolutely also do this with a knife, I did for the first few, but to make it faster if you have an angle cutter from shiftinglands.com, it speeds up the process a lot and also makes sure all of your angles are exact as well. These walls are extremely flexible and can be used not only between tiles but also on top of the lines of the inch grid if you cut a little deeper slit for the card in the middle of the tile. You can even have walls straddling multiple tiles. Make a few more walls that are 2 inches long instead and you can do even more things. Make a few 1 inch long end pieces and it gets even more flexible. All of these have the potential to stab in accessory slots for torches and wall decorations, but only if you want to. You can easily stab these in as and when you need them after the pieces are finished. As I've said, that's what I usually do. And of course you can make wood versions of these walls too, which is exactly the same idea. Just follow the tutorial for a wood wall in the stable video and just don't bother with the bottom half inch. For wood walls it is a good idea to cut your little slit in the bottom using a hot wire, if only for the fact that wood walls are a bit thinner than the stone walls. You can even make a quick interior door frame that uses the same modular doors as the main doors. The only difference here is that we need to place the door template with one corner exactly an inch from one edge and poke the hole in the top in the middle. I also added a strip of thick card along the top for stability. This means we can use the corners of the floor squares to slot the door in at the bottom and the frame works as normal above it. And that's interior walls. Incredibly cheap, flexible and easy to build. I'm honestly kind of excited to see what people do with this system. It's kind of like an open invitation to let your creativity go nuts. Now that's all the pieces I could fit into this month, but combined with the roof pieces that I showed how to build in the stable video, you can make some pretty awesome things. 
Most importantly, we can make them exactly the way that we want them and add some variety to interiors that otherwise would get a bit repetitive and boring. I'll also be adding a ton of different things to this system in future to enable things like T-junction roofs, overhanging floors, Watland Orb walls, tile roofs, and loads more. I'll use a tavern as an example here, but you can easily use this mix and match system to create anything from a town hall to a barracks. Just using what we have in this video and some accessories, we can build a multi-floor stone tavern with openable windows and doors, areas separated off by interior walls where you want them, and easily removable floors for interior playability. Add the roof tiles and those atmospheric tiles and walls become a full building to use in an outdoor scene, but one that you can easily take apart still when the ranger decides to run upstairs and snipe from a window. Not to mention, if you're running outdoor scenes, you can actually make half buildings with tiles only on the front, which allows you to make twice as many buildings with the exact same amount of crafting time. I always thought that stone floors looked a little bit weird upstairs though. They are, you know, stone. So let's change that to wood from the stable video. And while we're at it, change the columns to wood too. Already the build is looking pretty different. If you then change the upper floor entirely to wood, it's practically another building. Add another layer of stone walls to the middle without adding any floors and you now have a high open space downstairs and a single storey upstairs. Remove one of the roof tiles and you can include parts from the wall and temple system to add a tower to the building. Is this a fortified tavern? Maybe one run by the Zentarum or a criminal organisation? If you remove the window tiles and add more walls, we can then use the arrow slit accessories from the wall and temple system here too. Even with such a basic design that's barely changed in shape or size, just changing what tile types you mix and match allows for such a different environment in every new building. The same thing stands for the stable build that I showed previously. You can mix and match with stone tiles to get quite a different effect. Even something as basic as a stable can be completely different each time your players visit somewhere new. The interior walls alone allow for a vast range of different setups within a building and let you build exactly what you had in mind rather than settling for, eh, close enough. There are also some cool little tricks you can do with columns. I showed some of them in the stable video, such as using them for thin corridors where walls would be problematic or as larger columns for the middle of rooms. Combine them with a floor tile inside of a building though and you can make a balcony area in the tavern held up by full support pillars. I'll probably end up making an edge tile railing to go with this sort of thing at some point, but even without one, it adds an awesome bit of 3D to a room. Then if you want a bit more variety of shape, you can build L-shaped buildings by using a few slightly smaller walls as I mentioned in the wall section. You can even add a column to these smaller walls and just use them as regular 3 inch walls in any other situation. And this is before we even get to dungeons. Interior walls are a boon to dungeon building. For too long, making dungeons has relied on how big are my tiles. Everything has to be either 2 inches by 2 inches by 2 inches by 2 inches by 2 inches or 3 inches by 3 inches by 3 inches. And making more subtle rooms that have differences that uh, are a little less clear cut were quite difficult to do. With the interior tile system, with the interior wall system, you can make practically any shape of room you want if you make enough of the right type of tiles. Want to show a single wall or enclosed area within an existing room to add some interesting layouts? Done. Want to show a trap corridor with a slowly moving wall heading towards the players, forcing them into a fight or worse? Done. Want to build some 2x2 two two enclosed areas with a 1 inch wide corridor on one side, leading to an area with a column that is all part of a larger room with various accessories? Done. Rooms within rooms of almost any size or layout are possible with this system. Thin corridors like this one are also the perfect example of where removable walls are useful. To fit a base or mini that doesn't quite fit, all you need to do is bend the wall out a bit, or temporarily remove it. Another trick there is to raise up the interior wall a little and slip the base under there. There are tons of ways to make atmospheric enclosed spaces work. Another cool dungeon trick you can do is something you can do with door and window tiles. If you connect them with a little bit of tab sticking out the side and add another full wall behind them, you can create a wall with an alcove either a human sized archway that the rogue can hide in, or a wall of smaller alcoves that totally don't have traps or treasure in them. Honest. Then finally, as a finale, you can make use of the framework that I showed as part of the wall and temple system to build an awesome multi-layered dungeon section like this dungeon entrance. Whether you use this to show a few corridors or a full 3D dungeon leading from the ground up the framework and to a flat layer on top, combining these two systems adds so many more options. 
All of these can be used with the modular wall accessories that I've already shown in the Stable video and the Wall and Temple video, not to mention any future accessories that I make for this system, adding even more flexibility to what you can reuse from previous builds. If you're finding this video useful, it would be awesome if you could like and subscribe, or even share the video to help me reach more people like you. As you can see, I'm a big believer in making stuff that you won't only use once. It saves on time, it saves on money, it saves on storage space, and it's fantastic for beginners who don't have a massive collection to draw. I hope this building system proves useful for you guys. I can only imagine the different ways that you'd use it, but if you could send me pictures of anything you do build with it, that would be fantastic. I would love to feature them on the channel. That's all from me for now. Until next time, I'll be in the archive.